So thanks, Susanna, and thanks to the JGI team, especially Eddie, for the invitation to present here. So I spent two and a half wonderful years at the JGI as a postdoc, and uh, it's really great to uh, visit again and see all the great JGI people who make this uh, place stick. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a story about CRISPR. And so this story, before I forget, uh, was led by Asaf Levy, that was a PhD student in my lab, now a scientist at the JGI, and in collaboration with uh, the, the laboratory of Udi Kimron from Tel Aviv University. So um, most of you, or many of you, are familiar with the CRISPR system as being this great genome editing tool, you know, making this revolution of the Cas9 uh, genome editing. But the CRISPR is actually an immune system in bacteria. It, it's there to protect bacteria against the enormous amount of phages, of viruses, that infect them and kill them. So the, uh, the environment is infested by such, uh, such viruses. And the, and the uh, regular CRISPR locus on the genome looks like this. So it's a set of repeats separated by short spaces, which are phage-derived. Uh, and nearby, there are the cast genes. So you can see a 30-base long repeat, and then a spacer, which is phage-derived, et cetera. Now, about eight years ago, there was a landmark paper that showed that CRISPR is actually a defense system. And in this paper, they showed that, uh, so usually when a phage infects a bacterium, it will inject its DNA, and then the DNA will replicate in the bacterium, and eventually phages will be uh, formed and the cell will be killed. But if the cell has a CRISPR, occasionally, the CRISPR is able of stealing a piece of the phage genome and put it in, putting it as a new spacer. And once you have a new spacer that comes from the phage genome, you're protected. So since these eight years, we, I mean, many numerous studies have tried to decipher how this works, and we now have a really good uh, understanding of how this system works. So basically, the CRISPR immunity is divided into three stages. The first one is the adaptation stage, where the first infection is, uh, uh, so the, the, the DNA is in, the, in the, injected into the cell, and then a complex of two proteins, Cas1 and Cas2, take a piece of the phage DNA and put it as a new spacer. In the second stage, it's the expression maturation stage, this array of repeats and spaces are expressed into one long RNA, which is then processed into short RNAs. You know, the, the, uh, these are the, the, the basis for the sgRNA, for the applicative part. And then <clears throat> at the last stage, uh, which is called the interference stage, the other Cas proteins uh, form a complex with this short RNA, and then seek and destroy you know, incoming phage DNA by base pairing with the RNA. So this is, this is now, uh, uh, so the Cas9 is basically one uh, form of CRISPR. In the other form of CRISPR, you have multiple proteins attached to this RNA. Now, out of these uh, uh, stages, we really know well how the expression and interference stages work, but we don't know much about the adaptation process. And specifically, so let's look at this, you know, again. So when the phage or plasmid DNA is, is inserted or injected into the cell, Cas1 and Cas2 will take a piece of it and will insert it as the new spacer. The first spacer in the array will be the new spacer. But one of the major questions that remained unsolved is, you know, how does the Cas1 Cas and 2 identify that this is an invading DNA? Because there's so much more bacterial DNA in the cell. So, so usually a phage DNA will only be 1% of all the DNA in the cell. So how can, how can the Cas1 and 2 differentiate between the invading DNA, which is the minority of DNA in the cell, and the uh, uh, genomic DNA? So that's the question I wanted to address. Uh, and uh, to address it, we uh, teamed up with the Kimron lab, who developed a really nice uh, system to study CRISPR adaptation. So in their system, uh, we have a strain of E. coli that has a CRISPR array in the genome, but it doesn't have any Cas gene. So it cannot you know, do any adaptation or interference. Now they add on a plasmid, they add a plasmid that encodes Cas1 and Cas2. So this Cas1 and Cas2 can be expressed, and then they can take a DNA either from the plasmid or from the genome and put it into the CRISPR array. Uh, so normally, you know, we incubate these cells for 16 hours, and after 16 hours, you usually get about 2% of the cells uh, acquiring a new spacer. Uh, now, to measure the uh, spacer acquisition, what we do, we do PCR from the array, so one, spacer, one primer on, on one of the spacers and one primer outside of the array, then we PCR it, uh, 
And if there has been an adaptation event, there would, will be uh, you know, another band, all right? So the, there is the parental band and expanded band. This is uh, non-acquisition and acquisition. The expanded uh, uh, stands for acquisition. And then we sequence it using a Lumina sequencing just to you know, count how many times we see acquisition and wh what is the source for the acquired spaces. So the advantages of this system is that there's no interference because there's no Cas9 or other Cas genes in the system, and uh, so that self-targeting spacers can be still tolerated. All right. Uh, now, in our system, what we have is the genomic DNA of the bacteria and the plasmid. The plasmid is about 50 copies, and altogether, it 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 uh, compo composes about 5% of the DNA in the cell. So, if spacer DNA would have been taken just by chance would expect that about 5% you know, of the spacers would come from the plasmid or you know, one, genomic space, one plasmid spacer for each 20 spacers originating from the genome. What we actually see is that 98% of the spacers that are acquired come from the foreign DNA. They come from the plasmid. So this means that we have 1,000-fold enrichment for plasmid DNA. So Cas1 and 2 do have a preference for foreign DNA, and the question is how? So let's look at the distribution of spacers taken from the plasmid. This is the plasmid. It's a short plasmid, 4.7 kb. And the y-axis is the amount of spacers taken from each position. And you see that it's you know, highly diverse. I mean, some positions are really highly uh, sampled, and some positions are lowly sampled. And this is a typical uh, uh, case because um, in order to sample a spacer, you need to have a short sequence motif called PAM. And you know, some, some regions in the plasmid have more PAMs and other regions in the plasmid, the PAM is a three to two or three base long uh, motif. Uh, if we look at the genome, there is much less acquisition, obviously, but still there is you know, highly fluctuative uh, pattern. But now what we do is we zoom out uh, and look at the genome from a bird's eye view, look on the entire, uh, on the entire genome. And when we do that, uh, this is what we see. We see clear hotspots for spacer acquisition. Here is the position along the genome is the x-axis, and the amount of spacers acquired from each position is the y-axis. You see clear hotspots, and when Asaf first saw this distribution, it reminded him of a mustache. So since then, we call it the mustache, mustache distribution. So let me put it for you on a circular view of the E. coli genome. You see that uh, this is the origin of replication. The, uh, the end of replication, and, and the first thing that comes to eye, or one of the first things, that near the origin of replication, there are more spacers that are being acquired. And this is no uh, surprise, because when a, you know, in, a, in a rapidly growing bacterium, there's always going to be more DNA next to the origin of replication, because uh, you know, the, the, uh, the origin is the place where replication begins. But what was more surprising and more uh, striking is that there was a hotspot for spacer acquisition at the other end of the chromosome where the tear region is. And so we didn't know what te tear region was, uh, and so we went to the literature and read about that. So tear is the region where replication terminates in bacteria. So when replication begins in bacteria, I mean, the, there are two replication forks going one in either way uh, from the origin of replication. Now, the bacterial genome needs to have both these forks meet at the bottom of the genome, and then proper chromosome decatenation occurs. But it has no way to control the speed of each replication fork. So for this, uh, there, there were uh, tear sites that have uh, evolved. They were called tear C and tear N. These are fork, replication fork blocks. And this is how they work. If, for example, the blue fork is faster than the red fork, uh, it will reach the tear site earlier, and it will reach the tear C site and it will stop there. It will wait until the red fork arrives and then chromosome will be decatenated. If the red fork is faster, it will be stopped by the tear A site and wait until the uh, blue fork arrives and then decatenation occurs. And if for some reason there was, there's been slippage and the fork got away from, the, uh, uh, from this fork block, there are some backup tear sites called tear B and tear D and they stop it you know, right after. Now what we see is that these fork stalling sites are exactly the points that define the spacer acquisition hotspots. Okay, let me zoom it in for you. 
So this is the zoom-in region on the tear side. And what we see here is you know, the tear C and tear A in green. And you see that they exactly define the position where the uh, space acquisition uh, uh, hotspot begins. So space acquisition is, hotspot is upstream to these tear sites. So what we see from this view is that the fork stalling points, the fork stalling sites, seem to define the space acquisition hotspot. And we verify that by engineering a new, a de novo fork stalling site into the E. coli genome. And we saw that when we do that, when we engineered tear B into the E. coli chromosome, it formed a very strong uh, space acquisition hotspot. So it seems to us that, uh, that Cas1 and 2 preferentially acquire spacers near stalled uh, replication forks. And this raises, raises the question, uh, perhaps CRISPR adaptation depends on DNA replication. All right, we wanted to check this hypothesis, so we uh, worked with uh, a mutant, a temperature-sensitive mutant of E. coli that's called DNA-C2. And this mutant is able of replicating its DNA in 30 degrees, but in 39 degrees, no replication initiation uh, occurs, okay? And so we, we compared adaptation in this strain versus the wild-type strain. And we saw that in 30 degrees, where uh, you know, both uh, strains replicate their DNA, there is similar amount of spacer acquisition after 16 hours of incubation. About 2% of the cells acquire spacers. But in 39 degrees, the, the strain that doesn't replicate its DNA almost doesn't acquire any spacers at all. So it seems uh, that uh, spacer acquisition does depend, CRISPR adaptation does depend on replication. So why do we like this result? Uh, we like it because it largely explains the preference for the foreign plasmid DNA in space acquisition. Let me show you how. We called it the FDA theory, the Fork Dependent Acquisition Theory. It predicts efficient enrichment for foreign elements. So, so let's consider a hypothetical case where you know, a bacteria has a genome and two plasmids. Each of the plasmids is half the size of the genome. So together there is a same amount of DNA in the genome and in the plasmid. When these plasmids and genome replicate, the genome replicates using two replication forks, but on the plasmid there will be twice the amount of replication forks. So the replication fork count for the CRISPR system, they count how many uh, elements are replicating. If you have a small plasmid with high copy number, you get much more replication forks. And if replication forks are the point where spacer, spacers are acquired, you get much more enrichment for the you know, plasmid DNA when you acquire new spacers. Okay, so I still, uh, so this model explains the preference for the space acquisition from high copy plasmids. I still owe you some, something. I mean, if you, if you were, uh, your eyes were sharp, you saw that there was another space acquisition hotspot. It was here. Let me zoom it in for you. So it, it looks like uh, the same, you know, kind of uh, fork block that we saw uh, in the tear sites. But this is actually where the CRISPR system is. So this is the CRISPR array on the E. coli genome. And, and if you think about that, what happens in the CRISPR array? The CRISPR array, the Cas1 and 2, they open the DNA and they insert a new spacer. When they open the DNA, it must form a fork block. And then this fork block, again, is a space acquisition hotspot. Okay, so let's look again on this uh, plasmid preference. So if you carefully followed what, you know, the hypothesis that I presented, uh, you probably realized that this model predicts that the enrichment for plasmid DNA will be roughly equal to the plasmid copy number. Because the plasmid copy number, uh, uh, you know, determines the amount of forks running on the plasmid. So we have a plasmid that has a copy number of 50, but we see an enrichment for plasmid DNA about 1,000 fold. So clearly, you know, this model only partially explains the uh, observed enrichment, but not fully explains. Okay, so we went back to the data and looked at it more carefully. And let me show you this tear site uh, uh, spacer acquisition hotspots uh, that you see here. Uh, so so, so we, we see that the fork stalling sites defined one part of the acqu spacer acquisition hotspot, but not the other part. So clearly there is another thing that stops spacer acquisition from continuing you know, 
more upstream from the fork stalling side. And so we looked bioinformatically, Asaf looked bioinformatically, and what he found is that uh, the end of the spacer acquisition hotspot was exactly defined by you know, a sequence octamer, which is called a chi site. So have you heard of chi site? How many of you heard of chi site? Well, you know, some people are educated here. I've never heard of chi sites, but I, <laughs> so I went to Wikipedia, uh, or the literature. <laughs> So chi sites are known for many years as involved in DNA repair, of double-strand DNA break repair. So what happens in double-strand DNA break? Um, so if this is a double-strand DNA break, there is a complex called RecBCD that goes and chews the DNA, so it eats the DNA, until it reaches this eight-base-long chi site. And then it stops eating the DNA, and then begins to cover one strand of the broken DNA by RecA, and then this RecA invades into the other strand of the DNA to promote homologous recombination, and then you get this kind of picture that I never understand. I mean, this strand invasion, eventually the DNA is fixed based on the other strand of the, of the DNA. So let me show you again a picture really from Wikipedia now. So again, if you get a double-strand DNA break, you got RecBCD eating the DNA until reaching the sky site, and then you know it changes its activity and then covers one strand with RecA, and then there is the DNA repair. And what's there are a few things that are important about chi sites. First of all, they are asymmetric, meaning that you know the forward strand will all be so if the DNA is broken, uh, you know on one side it will be the, the RecBCD will eat the DNA until reaching the chi site only if the chi site is in the right orientation. So if the forward strand will be, will stop uh, RecBCD coming from that side, and the reverse strand will stop RecBCD coming from the other side. The other thing is that chi sites are found 1,000 times more often on the E. coli genome, than, so very often on the E. coli genome, so 14-fold more often than you'd expect by chance. So they're found every four, four and a half KBs on average. So if you have a DNA break, you, you'll meet a chi site about two and a half KBs, uh, you know, very, very shortly after. So this is what we uh, uh, know, what the world knows about chi sites. And it appears that spacer acquisition hotspots are defined clearly by the, the chi site. So this is the, again, the RecC uh, hotspot. Uh, so the, the, the end of the hotspot is exactly defined by the first properly oriented chi site upstream of the, of the fork block. This is the RecC case. Here's the, uh, the Ter-C case, here's the Ter-A case. You see that there are several chi sites, these are the red sites, several chi sites that are not properly oriented, but the first properly oriented chi site, this is the blue site, will stop the, uh, the space acquisition hotspot, and also in the CRISPR hotspot is the same story. So, so how, do, you know, how does DNA repair connect to DNA replication? Right, it seems to be completely different stories except that it's known for a long time that most of the double-strand breaks in the cell occur at stalled replication forks. So when the replication fork reaches the tear site, it's very frequent to see break on one arm of the fork, and then the DNA repair machinery fixes that break. Okay, uh, and a recent study that used imaging to image uh, um, double-strand DNA breaks showed that spontaneous DNA breakage are precisely correlated with the number of cell divisions, meaning that uh, most spontaneous break, break, uh, breakages result from DNA replication-based mechanisms. So most of the breaks you see in the cell are at stalled replication forks. So this led us to you know, form this model. So what we think happened is that the replication fork is blocked, and then a double-strand DNA break occurs. Then RecBCD come and degrades this double-strand DNA until reaching the chi site, and then the material for new spacers come from this degraded, you know, DNA debris that the RecBCD degraded. Okay, so this uh, yielded a hypothesis. We wanted to check this hypothesis, so we uh, checked what happened if we mutated RecB. If you mutate RecB, um, oh, and, and then of course, um, since the replication forks are uh, promoting double-strand DNA breaks, higher number of replication forks lead to higher number of DNA breaks. So, so we, we mutated RecB, and what, when we did that, we saw that there are less 
about half the amount of the spacer acquisition uh, as compared to the wild type, so less spacer acquisition in the mutated Rec B. But the most striking thing was to see that if we mutate Rec B, we no longer stop processing the DNA at the chi site. So we get much more spacer acquisition much uh, to, to a longer uh, uh, extent uh, upstream of the, um, of the fork block. And in fact, uh, once you mutate Rec B, you see tenfold enrichment in spacer acquisition from the self-DNA. So you lose, partially you lose the ability to uh, avoid the self-DNA. So here's what we think uh, happened altogether. This is our complete model, so I presented this part. Now, since uh, chi sites are much more dense on the bacterial genome than on foreign DNA, for example, our plasmid doesn't contain any chi site at all. So if you have one double strand DNA break, the Drake BCD will eat all the plasmid. Uh, then, so, so the density leads the uh, RecBCD or, and, and the CRISPR to avoid the, uh, the genomic DNA. So if you have a double-strand DNA break, you'll only take DNA, space of DNA, up to the first chi site. But if you are a phage genome, then the chi sites will be very, uh, uh, very sparse on your genome, and then there is much more DNA uh, eligible to be taken as a spacer DNA. Now, another factor is that uh, oh, so, so, so uh, quantitatively, since chi site density on the chromosome is 15-fold more uh, frequent than, uh, than, than uh, on, on phage DNA, uh, it, it, it gives a 15-fold uh, enrichment or avoidance of, of self-DNA, and the uh, copy number dependent enrichment uh, of the plasmid, together these two factors explain this, largely explain this 1,000-fold 1, enrichment for <clears throat> the plasmid DNA. And one last thing is that when a phage injects its DNA into the cell, the DNA is injected as a linear piece. A linear piece is perceived by RecBCD immediately as a broken DNA, and RecBCD will immediately go localized to this piece and degrade it, and again, providing a source for new spaces. So what I showed you here is a story in CRISPR adaptation, which remains a major frontier in the field, so we, there's still many details we don't know about CRISPR adaptation, uh, and, and I provided a solution to the self-non-self -self discrimination problem uh, that has bothered us for several years now. So, so CRISPR is the immune system of bacteria. It, it's, it's needed in, the, you know, in bacteria to protect against the vast amount of phages infecting them. But, uh, you know, CRISPR is only found in 40% of all bacteria. And a question that we deal with for many years now, several years now, is how do the remaining bacteria fight phage? There's nearly no, no place on Earth, except maybe, you know, obligatory endosymbionts, but no other bacteria on Earth that are not exposed to phage. So how do they fight phage? Uh, so the, the main two mechanisms that we know, the main two defense mechanisms that we know is CRISPR and restriction enzymes. And I guess it's, it's not a surprise or it's, not a, uh, it's no wonder that these two systems, when they were discovered, they made a revolution in biology. So the first discovery of the restriction system enabled to do you know, genetic engineering, basically. Now the discovery of a CRISPR system and is revolutionary, enables us to do genome engineering. And it's not only that. I mean, if you think of it, almost every time that a complex immune system have been discovered, it resulted in a revolution in biology. So think of RNAi. RNAi is an antiviral system, and it resulted in evolution of eukaryotic genetics. And even antibodies, you know, it's an immune system, but we now use it for so many th more things than immunity. And I think the reason why, you know, immune systems are so powerful tools is that they provide both molecular specificity and the ability to target the specific molecules that they recognize. This is the, you know, the things that the immune system needs to, have, you know, to identify self from non-self. And this is the things, this is, these are the tools that we need if we want to treat the molecular world. So what we are asking now is whether we can find new defense systems, whether there are more immune systems out there in the microbial genomes that we are not aware of yet. And so it's a challenge because immune systems evolve really rapidly. They represent a lot of innovation, 
but they have specific signatures that we can try and track down and, and test. For example, they, all of them are rapidly evolving. All of them are extensively horizontally gene transferred. And there are many other signatures that we can probe. And I don't have the time to, uh, uh, you know, to discuss uh, this in more detail, but I just want to show you uh, a new system that we found based on these evolutionary signatures that we called PREX or BREX, depending, yeah, depending on which kind of talk. And this was discovered by uh, Hila Zbero, who was a PhD student in my lab, and uh, she's also here in the audience. And this PREX system, which we discovered leaning heavily on the JGI's IMG system, is composed of, a, of six genes that are co-clustered together in many different genomes. About 10% of all the genomes you can find this BREX system. And if you look at the predicted functions of the genes, uh, the system composed of genes that you're not usually find, uh, you're not usually finding in other defense systems. So there, there is a protease, there is a phosphatase, there is a methylase, RNA binding protein. Uh, we don't know how it works yet, but we We've taken this system from a bacteria that has it, has it, and we transferred it into Bacillus subtilis that doesn't have it. We then infected Bacillus subtilis by an array, many different phage kinds, and we found that the system really efficiently provides protection to the, uh, to the bacteria. So if, if the bacteria has no system, you see you increase tenfold the amount of phage you infect, you see a really uh, rapid decline in the growth, but if the bacteria has the system, it's not infected at all. So again, uh, we don't know how this system works, but uh, uh, we, have, we have some evidence that it might work through a novel mechanism of action. We mutated this protease, it doesn't work anymore. We mutated uh, you know, the methylase, it doesn't work anymore, the phosphatase, uh, and we're now going deeper into the mechanism of action. So this BREX system is a new complex defense system found widespread in bacteria, efficient against a wide array of phages. We found that it blocks the DNA replication of the phage in a mechanism that we don't know how to explain yet, and we're now moving to decipher the mechanism of action. All right, with this, I want to end and thank the people. This is my lab at the Weizmann Institute, and the people who did the work you saw here is primarily our Saf Levy on the CRISPR work, Woody Kimmer and his uh, PhD student, Moran Golan, and Hilas Barrow and Tamara Goldfork for the BREX work, and thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Rodham. Do we have any questions? Yeah, nope. Bill. So um, I'm wondering, uh, with back to the CRISPR, that's really cool, the new one. Um, but the, uh, with the CRISPR, would that provide a selective pressure on viruses to start um, generating chysites in their genomes to slow things down? And if you've looked across all the viral genomes to see if there are any that are naturally enriched in the chysites. Right, so first of all, chysite is a kind of, uh, you know, the chysites are different between, you know, one bacterial file to another. So gamma protein bacteria has this octamer, you know, bacilli have a specifically different, uh, uh, you know, seven base long uh, sequence. Having a chysite on your genome, you know, brings another kind of evolutionary burden. For example, uh, temperate phages will not be able to integrate into the genome if they have chysite on their genomes. So, you know, some phages, cannot accumulate chysites, like lambda phage. It cannot accumulate chysites, otherwise it will be exposed to other problems in its life cycle. Uh, we didn't look for the distribution of chysites or cry-like sites in other phages, but I, you know, I assume that it would be interesting to, to do. Um, very nice uh, talk. Uh, I have a question. So the replication system that you were using was theta replication. Have you also tried a similar experiment using, for instance, a plasmid that had rolling circle replication? Right, not yet, not yet. It's a good question. We, 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 we hope to try and do that soon. I have a short question too. So is it any correlation with the present absence of the BREX uh, with the CRISPR? No, actually, no, we don't see a correlation like that. And, you know, so we looked for that actually. <laughs> we, we didn't see any. Um, so I think like our, our body, you know, bacteria needs to have many different layers of protection because phages would bring in anti-defense mechanisms very frequently. So we know that there are anti-CRISPR proteins. And so that's, you know, one of the reasons why the CRISPRs has diverged. So 
On the contrary, if you are in an environment that is uh, rampantly being attacked by phages, you'd want to have many different layers of defense systems. And unlike us, what bacteria can do is acquire new defense systems by virtue of horizontal gene transfer. So they accumulate uh, defense systems, multiple layers, and if one phage you know, overcomes one, one layer, you know, the other layer is there to stop it. And still some phages can overcome many different layers. All right, thanks. All right, thanks so much, Roto.